The first thing that comes out of this is that a lot of people, particularly um, customers of banks, have gold accounts at the banks. And they have been persuaded to have unallocated gold accounts, which basically means, well, I mean, it's because, um, you know, you go along to a bank and let's say you've got a few kilos of gold and you say, I want to open a, a gold account with you. Um, they will dissuade you from having an allocated account where the bank actually acts as custodian. Um, and they'll dissuade you by um, saying, well, you know, the costs of re running this account, you're going to find it actually quite uneconomic. I mean, you know, um, I think we pay something like 18 basis points, something like that to store gold. I mean, depending on, on, on uh, where it is. But a bank will charge you, I mean, something closer to ETF levels. Um, two reasons. Firstly, yes, I mean, acting as custodian um, does mean that uh, they have responsibilities. But the main thing is they would rather you are a creditor of the bank rather than you a depositor of something in custody. Because the moment you're a depositor, you are a creditor of the bank, you don't own that gold anymore, and the bank is free to do what it wants with it. Which is what happens, basically. A lot of these guys think they have got gold exposure by having a, an unallocated gold account. Now, when these banks stop offering unallocated gold accounts, which they will, they will just withdraw from the market. They will say, you know, we're no longer offering this service. I mean, from time to time, we've had people like ABN AMRO turn around and, you know, when they've had difficulty getting hold of gold, whatever, whatever, to help sort of offset the risks on their gold accounts, they've turned around and said, yeah, we're no longer offering this service. And they, you know, they close it down, whatever. Or the other way in which they do it is they've turned around and said, uh, we can't pay you out in gold. We will only pay you out in the cash equivalent. So, um, you know, you, you, you get these, the, these, these problems. Now, we're looking at huge quantities, as I say, sort of, you know, somewhere between three and four hundred billion dollars worth of unallocated accounts uh, and also COMEX, uh, COMEX futures accounts. So um, that soaks up demand. The supply soaks up demand. Remove the supply. What happens to the demand? A lot of that demand undoubtedly will disappear because um, uh, you know, if you if you if the bank shut down your account and won't offer you any other service, you probably go elsewhere. You probably don't do it anymore. I don't know, but a lot of people are going to want to buy gold, and they're going to want to buy silver, um, and they will go for physical. Um, but there isn't really very much liquidity in gold and silver markets at the moment. I mean, silver has been a story in the headlines recently, but um, it's also true of gold. So. Um, what does it do with the price? I mean, the only thing I can think is that the price is likely to be driven sharply higher as these banks remove their account facilities for unallocated accounts. And it doesn't just stop there either, because uh, the same treatment um, uh, is extended to banks dealing in um, uh, other commodities, uh, you know, derivative positions in other commodities, particularly energy and things like that, copper. Um, and, uh, you know, what a time for this to happen, uh, because that, you know, insofar as it drives up the prices of these things, uh, you know, we have got an inflation problem in the sense the purchasing power of paper currencies is going into the toilet. I mean, it's the only way to <laughs> put it. And then you get this happening. Um, it's it's not it's not good timing. But as I say, when they started doing this, um, you know, it went out for consultation in spring 2014. It was a very different world then. What's the response going to be? Um, I mean, this is this is interesting because what we would normally expect is we'd expect uh, perhaps um, the central banks to come together. I'm talking about the Western central banks, of course, to come together to form a new um, uh, sort of, if you like, selling cartel to try and sell um, uh, uh, physical gold into the market to satisfy demand, to keep the price down, if you like. Um, I'm sure that's what the Americans would like. Um, I think the ECB would like that. But I really don't see um, the Germans, the French, the Italians, who are the big holders in Europe, um, 
willingly going along with that. Um, and the other thing that's, it, well, the two are two further elements in this. Um, I don't know if you remember back to 2002, there was a guy called Frank Veneroso, who I, well, I wrote about this in the article, actually, we were talking about. Um, and Veneroso uh, did a lot of work um, trying to track down uh, how much central bank was leased or swapped into the market. Um, and he based this on a number of conversations he had with a guy with a, with a guy called Terry Smeaton, who I actually knew. I used to have lunch with Terry Smeaton in the, in the Bankers Club. Um, and in those days, I mean, there was a point, actually, um, that Veneroso was absolutely right that this, uh, you know, physical gold was going out of the central banks into the market and then disappearing. Um, the Bankers Club, where uh, Terry and I used to lunch occasionally, we literally backed onto the rear entrance of the Bank of England in a street called Lothbury. And you would see security vans going in and out, in and out all the time. I mean, they were obviously carting gold to and fro, mostly out, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that's what was happening. Um, I'm not saying it was the Bank of England's gold. Well, it's actually the U UK Treasury's gold. Uh, but it certainly would have been um, arranging leases for other central banks as a means of defraying the cost of storing gold in the Bank of England, if you like. Um, with the Bank of England acting as, uh, as a custody of their earmarked gold, which is the technical term they use. Um, but what Fenerosa came up with was he reckoned um, that at that time, anything between 10 and 16,000 tons of central bank gold was out on lease or swap. Now, that 16,000 figure was roughly half the total central bank gold um, reported as monetary gold, um, part of national gold reserves um, around the world. Now, I don't know what's happened to that situation. My guess is, and from what I've been told by other sources, is that the gold doesn't actually leave the Bank of England so much anymore. I don't know that it uh, stays there entirely. I don't know whether it's just part of it stays in the Bank of England, but basically they work more off a book entry system. And I think the reason that it has changed is that instead of just selling physical gold into the market. I think we're now in the realms of a sort of financial um, situation. I mean, it's really sort of trying to sort out uh, problems in either the futures market or the forwards market or whatever, rather than the old uh, situation, which, which was very, very different. But basically, the cost of leasing the gold was less than 2% and the return you're getting on US Treasuries was 6% plus. So this was a lovely carry trade. I mean, that's what it was being, basically being used for. That carry trade can still continue, but of course, um, it's gone the other way. I mean, you know, uh, you, 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 you can't really get any yield pick up by, say, um, you know, leasing gold in order to, to, to uh, put it on deposit or to buy US um, T-bills, for example. So that has fundamentally changed. But what we don't know is how much of this central bank gold is out on lease or swapped at the moment. Now, this is another problem because the demise of uh, these derivative markets, how are they going to get back that gold? Put another way, with gold already out in the market, probably in fairly large quantities, do the central banks have the ability to sell further gold into the market in order to suppress the price? I suspect the answer to that is no, or they would be unwilling to do so. Then there is another aspect to this, and that is that these shortages of gold in the West are the natural consequence of China's campaign to become the most important gold producer and physical gold market in the world. And as well as that, um, I have um, admittedly assessed that they have acquired something in the region of 20 to 25,000 tons before they authorize their own citizens uh, to enable them to, to uh, buy gold and silver uh, bullion. And that was in 2002. Since then, um, I think it's commonly estimated that uh, the, the Chinese um, uh, population 
as opposed to their governments, have accumulated over 17,000 tons of gold. So you can see that of what we would call monetary gold, um, the vast majority of it is now in Asia, because um, you've got the Indians as well, um, you've got the Russians, who are major producers, and they stopped using the dollar, basically, as their as a sheet anchor to their foreign reserves quite some time ago. Um, gold is now their sheet anchor, as it were. So you can see that of the monetary gold that's actually around, or gold which could be monetary in the sense that um, it is being hoarded against the day when fiat currencies fail or lose purchasing power or whatever, as opposed to being in jewelry or for industrial purposes, um, really uh you know the, the these markets that market is now controlled in asia and this brings in a geopolitical aspect if america wants to try and hit the gold market again with another series of sales she knows that she's on a hiding to nothing so what can they do i can't see they can do anything other than try and push out um the story that well you know gold was yesterday's story pet rocks you know i don't know why you bother we're not interested we don't care and i think that's probably the line they're going to have to take